I'd like to talk a little bit this morning about what happens if we move from design to design thinking. Now this rather old photo up there is actually the first project I was ever hired to do, something like 25 years ago. It's a woodworking machine, or at least a piece of one. And my task was to make this thing a little bit more modern, a little bit easier to use. I thought at the time I, would, I did a pretty good job. Unfortunately, not very long afterwards, the company went out of business. This is the second project that I did. It's a fax machine. I put an attractive shell around some new technology. Again, 18 months later, the product was obsolete. And now, of course, the whole technology is obsolete. Now, I'm a fairly slow learner, but eventually it occurred to me that uh, maybe what passed for design wasn't all that important. Making things more attractive, making them a bit easier to use, making them more marketable. By focusing on a design, maybe just a single product, I was being incremental and uh, not having much of an impact. But I think this small view of design is a relatively recent phenomena, and in fact really emerged in the latter half of the 20th century as design became a tool of consumerism. So when we talk about design today, and particularly when we read about it in the popular press, we're often talking about products like these. Amusing, yes. Desirable, maybe. Important, not so very. But this wasn't always the way. And I'd like to suggest that if we take a different view of design and focus less on the object and more on design thinking as an approach, that we actually might see the result in a bigger impact. Now, this gentleman, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, designed many great things in his career in the 19th century, including the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol and the uh, Thames Tunnel at Rotherhithe, both uh, great designs and actually very innovative too. His greatest creation runs actually right through here in Oxford. It's called the Great Western Railway. And uh, as a kid, I grew up very close to here. And uh, one of my favorite things to do was to cycle along by the side of the railway waiting for the great big express trains to roar past. You can see it represented here in J.M.W. Turner's painting, Rain, Steam and Speed. Now, what Brunel said that he wanted to achieve for his passengers was the experience of floating across the countryside. Now, this was back in the 19th century. And to do that meant creating the flattest gradients that ever yet been made, which meant building uh, long viaducts across river valleys. This is actually the viaduct across the Thames at Maidenhead, and long tunnels uh, such as the one at Box in Wiltshire. But he didn't stop there. He didn't stop with just trying to design the best railway journey. He imagined an integrated transportation system in which it would be possible for a passenger to embark on a train in London and disembark from a ship in New York. One journey from London to New York. This is the SS Great Western that he built to take care of the second half of that journey. Now, Brunel was working 100 years before the emergence of the design profession. But I think he was using design thinking to solve problems and to create world-changing innovations. Now, design thinking begins with what Roger Martin, the business school professor at the University of Toronto, calls integrative thinking. And that's the ability to exploit opposing ideas and opposing constraints to create new solutions. In the case of design, that means balancing desirability, what humans need, with technical feasibility and economic viability. With uh, innovations like the Great Western, we can stretch that balance to the absolute limit. So somehow, we went from this to this. 